Oh, goodness. Thank you. First of all, sticking around for the moment of nothing. Um, and thank you for choosing to join me today. You know, it's an honor to have um, anybody trust you with the Word of God. It's such a precious, precious treasure. And don't trust just anybody and everybody. But my prayer is that you walk away from this teaching empowered, emboldened, strengthened to take control of something so very vital and so very centered in our existence and our everyday life. And something that comes under fire and the enemy knows how to manipulate and the enemy knows how to get into. And, um, you know, before I go too far and just end up teaching the name or the title for this lesson, this message was, is having the mind of Christ. And that's what I want to talk to you about with this teaching is having the mind of Christ and your benefit from it. Uh, hopefully will father will interlace that since it, it's important to us. Yes. Before we get started, um, this is the teaching that I brought at the women's monthly Bible study. That's what I'm going to do is um, at the toward the end of each month after we've had the women's meeting, I will bring to you the um, subject matter and the notes from that and the insight from the group because the body comes together and, and we give thoughts and input, you know, and, and I pray that it blesses you. So let's have, let me pray over it first and then let's get right into it so that you can, you can do what you came to do. Amen. Heavenly Father, I thank you. I thank you that you've honored and trusted me with your word and with this message. Father, I say, let me not say or do anything that does injury or insult to the spirit. Lord, I'm asking, I, I declare by faith, thank you for straightening, for correcting me. Father, I declare by faith that we have eyes to see the truth, not just your truth, but the enemy's lies and see him for what he is, see beyond his deceptions. And Father, I declare by faith we have ears to hear, a discerning ear to hear your voice and your words and separate the wheat from the chaff as it comes to us. And Father, I declare by faith that we have a heart to receive, even if it means correcting our behavior, if it means changing the way we do things, our habits, whatever it is, we have a heart to receive it. And Holy Spirit, help us, strengthen us, you are the comforter, the counselor, and the guide into all of the truth. Help us to apply it and be doers of the word and not hearers only. Father, I ask your blessing on this that we do today. And I ask that your anointing flow through me. I am an empty vessel for your service, Father. And I thank you for it. I thank you for it. Bless every word spoken in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen and amen. So, oh, I should have said it before. Get your Bible. Get you a notebook if you're going to take notes. We only have a couple of scriptures, but you might want to write something down. You might want to mark it and then get something to drink and come. Let's reason together with over the word of God. Amen. Now, I, I said that. I should have said that a while ago, so you have a chance to do that. Sorry. <laughs> our mind sets at the center of our existence. We have to understand that. I'm going to hit a couple of foundational things that we need to understand before we can truly take control, before we can truly understand the battleground that we're on. Now, the mind is where things are seated. The mind is a gateway. The mind is a door, so to speak, and it goes both directions. Scripture tells us that as a man thinks, so is he. So whatever it is you're thinking on, you're creating in your faith, and you're letting it seep into your heart. As a man thinks, so is he. So what are you thinking? What is it you're allowing to ruminate? And that you're meditating on what you know the secular world and the enemy's twisted version of this is mind over matter you know and the self-talk and there's some truth in it because they took it from scripture and they took it from father's practices now when you do it founded in this when you do it 
based in faith, there you can absolutely, it's a springboard. But, well, let me back that up because it doesn't matter how you're thinking. Your thinking becomes your reality because your thinking also becomes your behavior, your emotions, and your perception. And whatever you're doing, make sure you're doing it through this word so that you have the right filter. Now, what you allow your mind to sit on becomes your reality. It becomes your emotional truth. It becomes your real time because you've let it set and you've let it set and you let it set. And it's crafted your reactions to things. Oh, glory to God. Father, thank you. One of the things I have to point out here is when, when the victim mentality and behavior begins, it has a starting point and it can very much be a generational curse. So what you take is, you know, the beginning or the foundation of it where you have somebody that was abused, mistreated, neglected, you know, all the things as a child or as a grown up, whatever, in their life, it happened. And then it transfers to the next generation in learned behavior. And the more you sit on it and think about it and the more you allow it to permeate your reality, you expect other people to attack you. You expect other people to respond to you, to treat you the same way the perpetrator or the bad guy, I mean, whatever word you want to use, your offender did. I mean, and it gets passed down. And next, you have a generation, a next generation, that automatically expects everybody to do that. They don't understand why, but it's come down. So your, your thought life will not only craft your reactions, your emotions, your um, anticipations, your expectation, but it actually will permeate the next generations because until it gets stopped, it's just going to copy and paste, and copy and paste, and copy and paste because as goes the king, so goes the kingdom. When the father does it, the son copies him. When the mom does it, the daughter copies her. I can tell you as a matter of fact that um, my daughter has several, um, I'm going to say poor qualities. She doesn't have poor qualities. She responds to certain things because of the way I responded to them. And it's all because of what I allowed to control my thought life. Now, we've broken that generational curse. She's aware exactly of where it came from and what it does. And she has taken up arms against it just as I have. It won't copy and paste to the next generation. It will stop here, but I passed it down. You're going to do the same thing or you are in receipt of the same thing, but you can change that because you can have the mind of Christ. You can have a filter that filters it all out. You just have to be willing to pursue, pursue it and craft it. Now, we train, We the Bible tells us that we should guard our heart. You know, it doesn't tell us to guard our mind. It does talk to us about having the mind of Christ, but it tells us to guard our heart. Now, I can't say that. I did not look to see if it tells us to guard our mind. So back that up. But out of the heart flow the issues of life. But I'm going to tell you that the mind is the gateway for the heart because what you let into your mind will saturate your heart. It will permeate and eventually get into it. That's why it says you um, gain faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. And the more you hear it, the more it's in your mind because it goes in here and it comes out here and it's got to go through that to get to that. So the mind is the gateway and the bulwarks. It's the guard. It's the, it's the protection for the heart too. What you let into your mind, you're going to allow into your heart. And what you stop, you stop. Now, we train our minds as we take control of our thoughts. We train our minds to reject ideas. We train our minds to reject um, interjections and honestly, bad seed as we take control of our thoughts. So that way, that is the only way to walk 
the way we choose to walk or live the life we want to live and be doers of the word and not hearers only. You know, you've got this guy here and you're like, you say, I don't want to be this guy. I don't want to react like that. I don't want my emotions on my sleeve. I don't want to be angry. I don't want to be unforgiving. I don't want to be bitter. I don't want to be jealous. This is what I want to be. And I want to be forgiving and loving and generous and have peace. And I want to be a light in a dark place and I want to run to the strong tower and I want people to see Jesus in me. Well, you've got this guy over here and you've got this guy over here and there's something in the middle. And the only way to get from this guy to this guy is this guy builds a bridge. So you take control of your thought life so that you have the mind of Christ. So you go from being this guy that you don't want to be and you come into being this guy that you do. But you have to do it through here. It's the only door you're going to find that transitions you from one to the other. But you absolutely can do it. You have control over your thoughts. Now, that's one of the things I brought up in an earlier teaching this month when we we're teaching about the mind and the importance of it. This is a battle. Nobody can see you fighting until it's been going on long enough that it starts flowing out in your words, in your actions, in your behavior, in your responses. When it starts, you're the only one knows you're under attack and you are the only one that can stop the attack from continuing. I can pray for you, and I will. If you, if you ask me for, I will be faithful to stand beside you. I will take up arms with you and push the enemy back. But I can't control your thought life for you. I can remind you, as a matter of fact, you get mad at me for me reminding you so much. I can remind you and remind you and remind you, but until you take action, nobody else can control what goes through your mind. Sorry, I need me a little table, don't I? And we haven't really got started good, so I need to move on. Your faith begins in your mind because it's a choosing. You choose to believe the word of God and you choose to continually put the word of God in your heart, in your mind, in your mouth, in your thinking. And as you do that, your faith grows. Sin starts in the mind too. Everything pretty much starts out in the mind as a thought. It's a thought, it's an idea, it's a suggestion, it's a temptation. And then you choose to act on it or you don't. And what have you trained your mind to accept so that you move toward that? Now, what I told you we were going to talk about was having the mind of Christ. I went through all of that so you would understand the importance of taking care of what you put in your mind and what you allow to stay there and that you're in control of it, nobody else. I do not know what it means to you when I say having the mind of Christ. I find that there are different perceptions. Some people are of the opinion that having the mind of Christ means always having the word of God available to you. The having the mind of Christ is always being um, pleasant and forgiving and, and, and um, having peace and grace and you know things of that nature. It's, it varies, I find, for people's different levels of understanding of scripture and the person of Christ, his character and his, his um, heart as you find it in the scriptures. It doesn't matter and I'm not, I'm not telling you you're wrong and I don't want you to question it beyond evaluating yourself. What I want you to do after, after this message, after this, this discussion is to take a look and see where you stand. There were certain things, when I sat down and I prayed about this, um, I've been teaching on and studying the mind all month with my pastors. And when I first started this and I was asking the Lord, you know, how and, and why and what, and just seeking his guidance in, in which direction to go. And I taught on the importance of the mind at the first of the month. And then there was a message on think on these things, you know, how to take control of your thought life. And when I finished that, I'm like, okay, what's left? We've covered everything. You know, what else can there possibly be? And he revealed this to me and there's certain steps and there's things we need to understand because he is a God of completion. He is a father of more than enough and he doesn't take anybody 
part way. And he, his stuff is in excellence and in perfection. And perfection translate is complete. And he wants us to strive for the same. And what I want you to be able to do, or I want you to want to do, is evaluate your thought life. Evaluate your mind and say, yes, I'm on that point of excellence, or no, I'm not, and this is what I need to do to fix it. You know, um, 1 Corinthians 11.31 tells us that if we will judge ourselves now, then we won't have to be judged later. If you judge yourself, um, let's say, lest you not be judged, I believe, I'm going to look it up because while I didn't think it was, hey, there's 1 Corinthians. Um, a brand new Bible, so I'm still kind of breaking the spine. 11.31. I said 13, didn't I? It's not. It's 11.31. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 31. I went too many pages. There it is. There we are. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. This is not a King James. It is. If we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. So if you'll, if you'll take and evaluate yourself, then you know you're right. You know you line up with the word of God and you won't be judged later. And it'll be like, I don't know what I did wrong. Well, you did because you had an opportunity or you were quickened to take a look at it. <laughs> Um, the points I want to get to, and what does it mean to have the mind of Christ? So mind, translated here, is intellect, feelings, and understanding. So we're going to talk about his intellect, his feelings, and his understanding. And the points we're going to go through are, are we discerning our thoughts? Are we truly being discerning about our thoughts? Are we settling for almost right? Because we need to learn to strive for excellence and not compromise for well, that's good enough. You don't start, stop part way because, well, that's good enough. Truth is absolute. Regardless of what your translation of it is, the truth is absolute. It either is or it's black and white, and it's that simple. A little leaven will leaven the whole lump. So we have four points we're going to talk about. 1 Corinthians 2.16, we have two pieces of scripture that he brought me to. For who hath known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. And Philippians 2, 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. So we have 1 Corinthians 2, 16 that we're going to look at in a minute. And Philippians 2, 5. Now let's talk about our points first. Because that's kind of going to bring us to that so that we can apply it. Are we discerning our thoughts? And then we're going to come back to our core thought you know, having the mind of Christ. So are we being discerning about our thoughts? This might be better put as, are you policing your thought life? Or are you just letting your mind run rampant and whatever falls in stays? And, you know, let me think on that for a while. When the thought comes up and the enemy's planted a seed, let's put it that way. When the enemy's planted a seed, do you watch it germinate and grow? Do you wait to see how it, it goes along? Or do you take it out? Do you stop it right there and put it away? Now, I have an example or testimony about that. Um, several years ago, 10 in fact, 10 years ago, my husband was working in Africa. No, you know what? Father, thank you. Back it up. In 04, 05, somewhere around that, um, my husband enlisted in the Army. He was Army National Guard and he was infantry. And while he was gone, there was little or no contact just because of the nature of the training. And one of the things that the enemy tormented me with, and I was still fairly young in my faith, I was learning, I was learning to stand on my own faith. I was, I was teaching a Sunday school class to young ones, but I was still growing myself, and that's the honest truth about it. And I would set feeling sorry for myself, to be honest about it, because he wasn't at home. At the time, my father was sick, and he was um, taking chemo and radiation, and I'll just tell you quite honestly, military doesn't pay as good as his civilian job, so we had that going on, and just there was a lot, and I would set and feel sorry for myself, and the enemy would um, 
take advantage of it. Don't think he's not going to take advantage of a moment of weakness because he absolutely is going to step in. And I would imagine, oh, Father, forgive me. I would imagine him, him dying, you know, the um, soldiers coming up. Yeah, yeah, in my mind, I can see my front door. <laughs> the soldiers coming to the front door and knocking to tell me that he'd been killed in some freak accident in training. And in my mind, I would go through the phone calls I would have to make and I would plan his funeral right down to would I go buy a new dress or would I buy, wear something I had? What would I do with chastity? How would I pack his stuff away? What, I mean, I would just entertain the thought all the way through. And of course I was a blubbering mess and worth absolutely nothing by the time I got to the end of, the, of whatever and, and finally shut it off. And I don't know how many times he did that, but I allowed it. When the enemy brought the thought to me, me now would be like, um, no, he shall live and not die and declare the word of the Lord. He'll declare the works of the Lord. He is covered by the blood. He is protected and go through the 91st Psalm. If I have to get it and read it out loud, but I would no longer entertain that thought. Why did I tell you all of that? Because you're doing that. When he brings the thought to your mind, you're following it through the possible path and making plans and you're calling it preparing yourself for the worst case scenario. And what you're doing is hurting yourself. How many times are you going to go through that before it finally you become numb to it and then you won't care if that happens and it gives the enemy the right to step in and do it because you've taken your faith off of the situation. That was a little, little bit aggressive. My, I don't know. I'm not sorry. Somebody needed to hear it. I have learned that is not the way you do it. But that's what happens when you entertain thoughts the enemy brings to you. Now, if you on purpose are going through your mind and you're it's standing in faith, I'll get it out in a minute. I've got so many thoughts going through. I'm ha I have to, I have to catalog them. Give me a second. If in your mind you are creating by faith a vision for tomorrow, you are purposely seeing your bills paid, the new car in the driveway that you want, the new truck in the driveway that you want, the building that you want built and furnished and busy, and the business that you want to grow and you can see the vehicles coming and going from your gate and the phone ringing and you got staff and all of that you're building that in your mind by faith that is how you build things in your mind by faith you chose to build it you don't let the enemy come in and take you down a negative path well god was preparing no he's not he would stop you if you're going down the wrong path and going to end up in destruction. Now, how, how well could I pray for my husband? My husband is out of the country at this point working. How effective are my prayers for his protection and his provision going to be if I am allowing the enemy to convince me or otherwise... Um, influence me to believe that it's God warning me something bad is going to happen if I don't do this or because he's gone. You know, he gets on a plane every few weeks to go quite a long ways and right there is at the enemy's opportunity, that plane's going to come down while you're asleep. That plane's going to crash and you're not going to know it. You know you're going to get the knock on that door. We've had this conversation and I shut him up. Why? Because he doesn't get to say what happens and I am going to control what I allow my mind to set on. And if we don't start doing that, if we don't learn to take control of our thought life, if we don't learn to police what we allow to set in our thoughts, 
we won't have control of the battlefield. We, and that's what I'm, in truth, that's what I'm talking about. You have to control the battlefield. When negative comes up, what are you doing with it? When that negative mind or that negative thought gets started, what are you doing about it? I mean, are we just letting any old weed grow up until it becomes a nuisance? Are we doing something about it when we see it first start coming up? The difference between the story in the Bible that talks about the wheat and the tares being sown together and you have to wait for the harvest is that we know what's wheat and what's tare. We know what is good and what's bad. We can pull the weeds before they ever get started, but we have to police our thought life to do that. Now, let's move on. Are we getting it almost right? So we've taken a little bit of control here and we've kind of shut it down and but you know, these, these ones here, they're not that big a deal. I mean, why can't I think about what I'm going to do? Why can't I plan in case something bad happens? Well, are you planning for failure or are you trusting God? You ask father, what do I do? And you plan for the harvest. You plan and you prepare for success. You don't have a safety net. Faith doesn't create safety nets, and that's the truth of it. So God's hand, go, it go, this really does go hand in hand with the first point, but are you willing to put up with good enough, or are you striving for excellence? Are you pushing for the best possible outcome so that you have complete control, or are you just kind of halfway guarding the gate? You know, a few little stragglers come through once in a while. It's no big deal. Really? Because those stragglers become weeds that become a full-blown harvest, and then you've lost your peace again, and you're at torment. Oh, I have to open it. Duh. So, I mean, are you settling for just good enough, or are you pushing for excellence? Now, the, the third point was truth is absolute. The truth is absolute. God is no respecter of persons, and neither should we be. I mean, if, if it's wrong for this person to do it, then it's wrong for this person to do it. If it's a sin and it's, uh, and it's against the word of God for this guy, then it's the same thing for that guy. And I bring that up as far part of our mind is our perception of other people's offenses and how we think about the lives of others. And I mean, how many times are we more likely to overlook the sin in the lives and hearts of those closest to us, our friends and family, than we are strangers? Yes, I've seen it, I don't know how many times I hear people talk about it. If you're willing to forgive Matt for it, you gotta be willing to give Scott. It's that simple. You can't hold it against Chris and not hold it against James. And Peter and Paul were just as guilty of wronging as Judas and, and anybody else. Sin is sin and truth is absolute. I was reading in Leviticus this morning and um, chapter 17. Let me see if I can find it. I'm really liking this new Bible. Um, it's chapter 17 because it was talking about sin. And one of the arguments, well, most of Leviticus talks about sin, doesn't it? <laughs> um, one of the arguments that I've heard about um, the homosexual community and, you know, some that choose that lifestyle and the others that don't, the argument or the defense is everybody sins. Well, yes, we, we have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. We understand that. Scripture will tell you that the same way. And I, I don't even know why I'm looking that up. It, the scriptures are very specific to say that it's a perversion. The homosexual um, lifestyle and relationship is a perversion. But it doesn't change that it's as much sin as lying or um, stealing or adultery or murder. God see he's no respecter of persons. Truth is absolute. It is a sin to lie. It is a sin to um, steal. It's a sin to kill somebody. It's a sin to, to have relations 
other than the natural that God created. And, it's, and he lines it out in his word. Truth is absolute. There's no varying degrees. And just because you love this one and don't love that one doesn't make his sin less than that one. Your perception of it is what's important. And we have to remember, God is no respecter of persons. We cannot support one and not the other. You love people, you forgive them, and you talk to them about the love of God so that they walk away from the sin lifestyle. Whether, no matter what it is, if you're guilty, you're guilty. As a matter of fact, let me point this out. The Bible says that if you hate your brother, you're guilty in your heart of, of murder. So you don't actually have to take a man's life to be guilty of that sin. So consider that too, okay? Moving on, a little leaven. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. Any level of compromise removes a piece of the full pie and you are now lacking 100%. Um, one of the things I would use as an example is to take a plate, a clean plate, and let the dog lick this much of it over on this side. Now, do you want me to put food on it and serve it to you? Or, you know, would, would you rather me wash it and get a clean one? Because, I mean, he only touched this much. The whole plate is dirty now, I promise you. I don't, the whole plate is dirty now because this much got touched. A little bit of leaven leavens the whole lump. So when you allow just a little bit, when you're not striving for that perfection, when you're not pushing for excellence, when you let just a little bit in, you corrupt the whole thing and you start losing ground on that battlefield. The enemy starts to win and you'll find that each battle gets a little bit harder because you allowed a little bit to come in and a little bit goes a long way, especially when we're talking about the enemy. He has had generations to hone his skill, to get good at this, to get crafty, and to find all the ways. You have one. You have one. Now, there's a way to defeat him. God gives you all of the answers. He gives you all of the resources. But it is up to you to pick up the shield, to pick up the sword, to put on the armor and, and take up the battle and push him back. It's a matter of how much you're willing to accept because a little bit of leaven leavens the whole lump. Amen? Now, let's revisit the scriptures we were talking about so that we can put all of this together because I've kind of given little stair-step pieces. Let's put the whole picture together, yes? 1 Corinthians 2.16. I'm going to read the verse with the translation. Now, remember, the translation of mine was intellect, feelings, and understanding. So I'm going to put this down. So let me read it with the translation in it, yes? For who has known the mind, the feelings, the intellect, the understanding, the perception of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have, we have the mind, the feelings, the intellect, the understanding and perception of Christ. We have it in his book. We have it in our minds when we develop it and we keep putting the word in there and we and think on these things. When we go back to think on the things he told us. We have that. Amen. Philippians 2, 5. Let his mind, his intellect, his feeling, his understanding, let his perception be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. Having the mind of Christ is not just about knowing, understanding the word, but also how you are a doer of the word and not a hearer only. It's also about how you apply the word 100% to all of your thoughts. Having the mind of Christ is how you police your thought life. Having the mind of Christ matters every thought. You know, the Hebrew phrase talking about every comma, every period, every letter of the Bible, they'll say every jot and tittle. <clears throat> so every jot and tittle of your thinking has to be filtered through the word of God. Everything in order for you to take control of that battlefield. And that's what we want. We want to take control of this battlefield. If we control it, we've won the battle. And this is a fight that you have to start on your own. Others can come up alongside you. I will stand linked arm in arm with you and push him back. But you have to be the one that takes control. Amen? 
Now, are you approaching all things from the perspective, from the feelings and understanding of the Lord? Do you have a biblical view of your life, your behavior, your reactions, your responses, and people? Do you apply the word of God to everybody and everything? Most of us would say, yeah, of course I do. Do you? Because how many times have, going back to the truth is absolute, how many times was it so much easier to forgive those that you loved than it was those that you don't know? Because honestly, okay, yes, sir. Think about this. If your son, your daughter, or your sibling was to commit murder, think about it, was to kill somebody, your first response is, what made you do that? I know you. You've got a good heart. But when you sit and watch the news and hear about somebody doing the same, is that your response? Is the forgiveness and hope already generating within your spirit? Are you saddened by what's happened in judgment against the person? Or because there's a soul, first of all, gone now when it wasn't supposed to be, and another in danger of the fires of hell. And many of us would say they deserve the fires of hell. Is that your call to make? Are you looking at them through the perception of Christ? Because when Christ looked at Judas, what he saw was something that had to happen to fulfill scripture. He never treated him any differently. He never, he never talked to him any differently. And he didn't, well, till that last meal, and I don't think everybody picked up on it. He didn't out him that much. I mean, seriously, he knew. He knew. And what did he say to Judas? Do what you must, but do it quickly. And he forgave him. I promise he forgave him. Because he knew what had to happen. And I'd almost, knowing the heart of Christ, having gone through scripture, I would say that it hurt his feelings. He knew it was going to have to be one of them, clearly. But it hurt his feelings that it happened. You know, because look at the torment. What we don't know, what scripture doesn't address, is what if Judas had had asked for forgiveness, had repented. Because once Jesus went to the cross, the new covenant's cut. He could have repented. Maybe he did, and we just don't know it, and you'll see him when you get to heaven. I don't know. Um, I lost my place. <laughs> Not just through the word. That's why we can have the proper understanding. Not just through the word. You have to, you have to come from his heart as the word lays it before you, like I was just speaking of. You know what the word says, and sin, the wages of sin are death. Well, it's all sin. Lying's a sin, too. How many lies did you tell last week? And the wages of sin are death. Look at things through the heart of Christ, and you have the mind of Christ when you start approaching people, especially the offenders that you don't know, with the same grace, with the same forgiveness, with the same compassion that Christ did as he walked this earth. How many times was he ridiculed? And they tried to kill him. And they'd chase him out, and they they were always trying to discredit him, and more so as it got closer to the cross. Didn't slow him down. You didn't hear him bad-mouthing them. He told them, this is where you're wrong. He told them, this is what the word of God says. This is what grace is. This is what the truth is. But he didn't get in his screaming match. He didn't cut him down. What is the heart of Christ in your thinking? Are you walking through his shadow perceiving other people? The Bible says that that which you do to the least of these brethren, you do also unto me. It doesn't say just your family and friends. It doesn't say those that are without sin. It doesn't say those that just sin a little bit because the wages of sin are death, regardless of the level or, or um, degree. There is no degree in Christ in God's eyes. That which you do, the least of these, my brethren, you do also unto me. So no matter who it is, what they've done, or where it's at, that which you do to the least of these, my brethren, you do also unto me. I should have taken this off. Yeah. Okay. Let those without sin cast the first stone. Are you sin free? 
Can you cast a stone? Amen. Can you cast a stone? Not willing that any should perish. Father wants everybody to come to Christ. Father wants everybody to know the truth. Everybody to come to repentance and everybody be saved. Are you looking at it the same way? Having the mind of Christ means doing that too. Pray for those that curse you and spitefully use you. Again, the truth is absolute. No matter who it is, the word applies to everybody. Are you praying for those that use you, that spitefully use you and curse you? Father also said, forgive. Jesus said, forgive so that my Father can forgive you. So holding things against other people only separates you from Father further. It doesn't matter what they did. Sin is sin. And that's going to make some people mad. Sin is sin. And you're allowing their sin to separate you from him. Amen? I might not have gotten agreement there. Even the heathen love those that love them. Be better than that. You love the others, the ones you don't know, the ones you don't like, the ones you don't approve of. Because even the heathen love those that love them back. How are you any different than the world if you act just like the world? Now, Philippians 4.8, I'm going to tell you how you get to that point. You get to that point by controlling your thought life. You get to that point by controlling your mind. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. That means don't think on the offense. Don't think on the jealousy. Don't think on the envy. Don't think on the loss. Don't think on the insult. Don't think on what they did. You think on the things of the wor word, not the world. You think on the word, not the world. That's how you take control of that battlefield. And having the mind of Christ means controlling the battlefield and looking at your world, the people in it, the things in it, the job, the circumstances, the battles, through the word of God. And, per, and pushing for excellence. You don't let a little bit stick around. You don't let a little bit in. You shut it all down. Because a little bit of leaven leavens the whole lump. And having the mind of Christ means having, having it all in excellence. And I want to come to Philippians 4, 9 in closing. It says, those things which you have learned and received and heard and seen in me. And this was Jesus. It's actually Paul. But those things you have seen in him, in Jesus, in the word, following him. Those things which you have learned and received and heard and seen in him. Do that. You do that. And the God of peace shall always be with you. Philippians 4.9 should become a battle cry of sorts. That which you have learned, you've received, you've heard and seen Christ do. You do that and the God of all peace will be with you. Having the mind of Christ is a whole lot more than just having the word of God. Having the mind of Christ is being like Christ feeling like Christ, having his intellect, having his perception, and, and treating other people the same way he would treat them if he is standing there in front of you. We can do this. I say we because, I mean, I'm in line. I'm not perfect, and I fight the same battle. But we can do this when we use the word of God as the filter, as the springboard, as the foundation. And if we let the word of God, the way he said it's supposed to be, the things he said we're supposed to think on, the things he said we're supposed to do, the things that he said are important, with, and the truth is absolute, without compromise, because a little leaven leavens a whole lump. We police our thoughts the way we're supposed to. We strive for excellence then we can absolutely squash the enemy. And he has no place here. He has no place in us. And it's all going to start here. Again, if you, want, if you don't want to be this guy, you want to be this guy. The one in the middle is going to build the bridge. And you're going to build the bridge by having the mind of Christ. You can win. I promise you can win. But that's the only way, is having 
his mind in you, his intellect in you, his feelings in you, his understanding in you. And the only way to do that is to police your thoughts, to think on these things as Philippians 4, 8 said. Amen. Now I pray, I pray that you receive this in the love that it's meant for. And I pray that it helps you, it empowers you, and takes you that step further into a better, stronger relationship with the Lord. And I pray that you're delivered. You're delivered from the enemy's grasp and that your, your thought life becomes yours and becomes free and it becomes the thinking on these things so that there's peace in it and the enemy can't touch you anymore. And I thank you for joining me today. Now, I love you, but more importantly, he loves you. Have a good day.